am volunteering at an after-school community center on the south side of Chicago. As I'm getting ready to leave, one of the young men, let's call him Marcus, stops me and says, hey Kev, how you getting home tonight? I tell him that I'll be taking the bus because I don't have my car. He says, well, be careful because it gets dangerous around here at night. He then proceeds to tell me a story about how he saw a man who had been shot and killed outside of his apartment. Marcus is nine years old. I was speechless. Even though I didn't know how to respond, that moment has stayed with me to this very day. When I got back home later that night, I could not stop thinking about Marcus, and I haven't stopped thinking about him since. For the past three years, I have heard countless stories of pain, trauma, loss, and violence from the amazing young men that I've had the privilege of working with at a therapeutic residential facility here in Chicago. Marcus's story and the many others have inspired me to search for some type of tangible solution to a complex problem rooted in years of discrimination, segregation, and racism. I want you to take a moment and imagine with me what the south and west sides of Chicago would look like without the threat of gun violence. Imagine a Chicago where parents and kids don't have to worry about the safety in their neighborhoods. Imagine a Chicago that does not receive national media attention for having some of the highest rates of gun violence in the country. Imagine a Chicago where economic development does not negatively impact the longtime residents of low-income communities. Imagine a Chicago where south and west side neighborhoods are thriving economic engines. Today, I'm inviting you to reimagine the city of Chicago. The south side of Chicago, the west side of Chicago. These are two parts of the city that are ignored by many through both fear and ignorance. Have you ever asked yourself why some parts of the city look so drastically different when compared to others? Ever since moving to the city in 2014 as an outsider looking in, I have been intrigued by the structural differences that exist in various neighborhoods. For instance, why does one neighborhood have successful businesses, nicely paved roads, and beautiful landscapes, when another neighborhood struggles with high rates of gun violence and lack of economic resources? What are the consequences of having neighborhoods that are so socioeconomically segregated? In a recent 2016 study, the University of Chicago found that five Chicago neighborhoods alone accounted for nearly half of the city's overall homicide increase. These five neighborhoods were Austin, Englewood, New City, West Englewood, and Greater Grand Crossing. Four of these five neighborhoods were predominantly African-American, and all five of these neighborhoods had unemployment rates of 9.6% or higher. To provide you with some context, that is more than double the unemployment rate in the entire United States. Let's break that down a little bit to better understand how unemployment and violence negatively impact people. Without a sustainable income, people can struggle to take care of their basic needs, like paying for rent or a mortgage, buying groceries, paying for gas or public transportation, and preparing for, this, preparing for the future. Living paycheck to paycheck can be extremely stressful and anxiety-provoking. I know this stress personally from growing up in a single-parent household in Manchester, New Hampshire, where money was tight. My father is an immigrant from Haiti who worked two jobs most of my childhood, and my mother, who is from northern New Hampshire, was an administrative assistant at an urgent care center. My parents divorced when I was four, so my sister and I moved into an apartment when we were young. I can recall times when there would be a letter on the front door stating that we had not paid rent yet, and if we didn't make a payment soon, we could be potentially evicted. I can remember times when we would be driving around in a car, and the car would break down, and we wouldn't have enough money to take care of the repair, so my mom would have to ask others for help. Growing up like this was extremely stressful and anxiety-provoking for me as a little boy because I never felt financially stable. But at least I wasn't dealing with violence at the time. The neighborhood that I grew up in didn't have a lot of issues with violence, and gun violence was very rare. If you add violence to my childhood, there is no telling where I or my sister would be today. Research shows how exposure to violence can change the structure and function of a child's brain. The American Academy of Pediatrics refers to this phenomenon as toxic stress. 
Toxic stress can change the behavioral and health problems for young people. Too many of our Chicago children are living under toxic stress, and their brains and internal organs are suffering the consequences. Chicago needs to also better understand its history, and quite a troubling history, um, to understand its current predicament with violence and unemployment. In the 20th century, Chicago enacted racist policies and practices that discriminated against African Americans. These policies and practices can be traced back to the Great Migration when African Americans moved from the South to the North for a better life. Many white Northerners were upset and fearful about having to share their neighborhoods with someone of a different skin color. One of the most notorious practices to come about during this time was redlining. Redlining was when banks refused to provide loans to African Americans who wanted to move into white neighborhoods. Along with redlining, after World War II, white veterans received subsidies from the federal government to purchase, for low interest loans, to purchase new homes in the suburbs. African American veterans did not have the same type of access to this program. Even when African Americans successfully moved into white neighborhoods, white flight took place immediately. Without these loans or subsidies, black Chicagoans were left in overcrowded housing with landlords that did not care and didn't uh, maintain the property. So, public housing in the form of high rises were built as an alternative to rundown housing. Over time, these high rises became isolated parts of the city where unemployment, poverty, um, drugs, violence became uh, the norm in these areas, and they were heavily concentrated. Eventually, these high rises were torn down and the residents were relocated, but the poverty, drugs, and violence continue to this very day. So, we've now got poverty, drugs, violence, toxic stress, racist policies and practices, and hyper segregation. When we add all of these ingredients into the recipe, can you really be surprised at the outcome? Really? Think about that for a moment. Public officials and civic leaders have many different ideas of how to solve the issue of gun violence in our country. Some might say that we need to uh, have a greater police presence in the community, while others might say that we need to focus more on our education system, or that we need more access to mental health resources. There's no one magical solution to this problem, but I think I know where we can begin. I believe the conversation needs to begin with economic development. In one of his most famous speeches titled The Ballot or the Bullet, Malcolm X said, we should own, operate, and control the economies in our communities. We need to become involved in a program of re-education to educate our people into the importance of understanding that when you spend your dollar out of the community in which you live, the community in which you spend your money becomes richer and richer. The community that you take your money out of becomes poorer and poorer. And then what happens? The community in which you live becomes a slum. The conditions become run down. Malcolm X's words were very wise, and they're still really relevant today. Today, we do not own, operate, and control the economies in our communities. Instead, we stop, shop at liquor stores and currency exchanges that take advantage of our community and guarantee that the money leave, just like Malcolm said 60 years ago. So, we know we've got a problem. Our neighborhoods that are economically deprived are struggling with high rates of unemployment and high rates of gun violence. So what's the solution? We need to provide resources and opportunities for neighborhood residents to own and operate the businesses in their communities. But how do we get there? What if there was a program that was supported by either public or private dollars that allow neighborhood residents to own and operate the businesses in their communities? Imagine you have a restaurant in an economically deprived neighborhood in Chicago. This restaurant ends up being successful and financially stable. Neighborhood residents are hired at this restaurant, and there's a unique apprenticeship program that provides two promising employees with the knowledge and education needed to own and operate the business. After completing the apprenticeship program, the two employees will then have the business under their vision and management. You might be thinking right now that that is way too good to be true, but 
I want to challenge you and say, why not? I currently live in South Shore where I see plenty of hungry students and working professionals getting breakfast, lunch, and dinner from many fast food restaurants. Is it really too hard to imagine that those same folks are going to walk into a community-owned restaurant? And is it too hard to imagine that that same restaurant is owned and operated by a resident of South Shore? You see, when we get to this point in the conversation, we are now talking about neighborhood residents creating the economic change needed in their neighborhoods. We are no longer talking about the big grocery store chains and fast food restaurants creating jobs in the community, which, don't get me wrong, is vitally important, and I am not downplaying the role. But I want to take you one step further. I want to take you to a place where the restaurants, cafes, diners, laundromats, tax services, legal services are owned and operated by the people in the community. We need to begin to have a shift in our mindset and view the people as a solution to the problem. They are the untapped potential. I want you to take a moment and imagine that reality for our city. It is critical for the privileged and those in positions of power to focus all of their attention on early job skills training and providing neighborhood residents with a stake in the game, especially the disenfranchised. I'm envisioning a Chicago where the disenfranchised have the power to dictate their future, instead of having to rely on others who don't care or don't understand. I want you to think about that for a moment. We are the future change agents of our community because we will hire those who have gone through the criminal justice system, because they are our brothers, sisters, loved ones, and neighbors. Good people just looking for a second chance. We will hire the men and women that are undocumented because they are our friends and our loved ones. And we know that they're not criminals. They're just people looking for a better life. We will pay a livable wage because we care about the quality of our community and we recognize the common unity and community. There is absolutely nothing that can stop us once we become unified and begin to empower one another. Inspired by Malcolm X's vision, I am currently pursuing my MBA at DePaul with the hopes of one day starting a small business on either the south or west side of Chicago. Before starting this business, I want to move into the neighborhood to have a better understanding of what the neighborhood residents want and need. It is always important to allow the people to be part of the process. This business would hire people from the community and would have a unique apprenticeship program that would equip the two employees with the knowledge and education, again, needed to own and operate the business. I am thoroughly convinced that this can happen. I got a lot to figure out, but in order to reimagine, you must think about what is currently impossible and find ways to make it possible, right? So that's what I'm inviting you to do with me today, right here, right now. I am sick and tired of seeing images on the news of beautiful brown and black children, men and women getting shot or being the perpetrators. I don't want to see another mother cry, staring into the camera saying, please stop the shooting, as she prepared to bury her child and say goodbye one final time. What happens when we see these events unfold on our television screens? They reinforce negative stereotypes about the Chicagoans that live in these neighborhoods. They make us think that this is the way that it will always be in Chicago, and that the people living in those communities, they don't have a chance. But that couldn't be further from the truth. The historical and ancestral lineage of these neighborhoods is rich with people who have fought for social change. From Robert S. Abbott and the Chicago Defender in the early 1900s, to the 21-year-old Fred Hampton and the Black Panthers, we stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us. It is time that the residents of South and West Side Chicago neighborhoods create the change that they need. The question remains, will we provide them with the resources to do so? Because they always have been and always will be the foundation for change. I want to invite you in a thought experiment. I want to challenge each one of you to imagine nine-year-old Marcus from the south side of Chicago differently. I want you to imagine Marcus as the future business owner, entrepreneur, and change agent in his own community. Thank you. <laughs>